in this lesson, you're going to identify the functions of vector norms, differentiate the norms from each other, and evaluate the roles of vector norms in deep learning. In our last session, we learned about linear independence and span. We learned about the two scenarios for linear equation. The first one is there is no solution, and the second one is that there is an infinitely many solutions for some values of b. We also learned that linear combination of some set of vectors is given by multiplying each vector by corresponding scalar coefficient and adding the results. We learned that the easiest way to know that your vector is not in the column space of a certain matrix is to examine if the columns are scalar multiple of each other. If you missed lesson number six, the link is given in the description below. You may pause this video for a while and come back if you're done with it because learning number seven is more exciting if you learn lesson number six. In this lesson, we will learn about analyzing vector norms role in deep learning. So the very, very first question in your mind I know that must be answered is this. What is a norm? Let's first define first what a norm is. So definitely a norm refers to the overall length of all the vectors in a space. So intuitively, a norm of a vector x measures the distance from the origin to a certain point. So for example, let's have this illustration. Okay, right? So let me use another color so it can be seen properly. So of course, you know that this one is the, the origin right? And supposing you're going to travel, go into this part, okay, to this point, but you have to pass through this point and also this point. Okay, so just considering the fact that you're going to travel straight. So what would be the distance from the point of origin going to the point of destination considering that you're going to pass through point A, which is point A, and point P. So basically that's the idea behind the norm of how we're going to compute the length of the different vectors. Okay, so with this illustration we can say that a norm on a vector space V is a function like this. So this defines what a norm is. Okay, so again, a norm on a vector space V is a function of V going to R. So it means that the absolute value defined as V to R and from the value of X, which is an element of V to its absolute value. So see, we are considering here the absolute value of a certain element or a certain number. So remember the time when we talk about um, scalar, so we said that scalar has something to do with magnitude and length. So definitely every s length is of positive value. So because if it's negative, then we can never say that there is some kind of uh, magnitude. Okay? So this assigns each vector x its length which is the absolute value of er. And this absolute value is a real number. So for us to utilize the function norm properly, certain properties must be satisfied because we cannot just use the norm function in its time we want so they are so not really a lot of but three properties that we have to take note of for us to be able to use norm function let's have the first one so this first function tells us that norms are zero and only if the vector is a zero vector so this is called Positivity. Okay. Positivity. 
Again, let me repeat that. Norms are zero if and only if the vector is a zero vector, but it can never be negative because we said that it's positive. Okay, next, number two. If you consider norm as a length, this is what I've said, if you consider norm as a length, you can see why it can't be negative because the length always has a positive space. So the length of a scalar product of a vector is the length of the vector multiplied by the absolute value of the scalar. So this property is called the positive scalability. So it means that we increase the value of a certain vector by multiplying it to a certain scalar, scalability. Okay, and remember that, that the, the value of this scalar must always be an absolute value. And an absolute value is always positive. I've been repeating that. Okay, now, the third property says that norms respect the triangular inequality. So this one is called triangular inequality. Okay, inequality. So what does this mean? So triangular inequality states that for any triangle, the sum of the lengths of any two sides must be greater or equal to the length of the remaining side. So for example, so we have this one. This is a triangle, All right? So we have this side A and then side B, and then this is side C. So it states that the length of C could be the sum of A and B, okay? Which, in this case, the sum could be equal to, it could be equal to, or it could be greater than the sum of A and B, but never less than, of course. Okay, so that's about the concept of norm. Now, there are a number of ways to measure the magnitude of vectors. So we have L1, L2, P norm, L infinity, and of course we have the zero norm or L0. So let's have them one by one. Let's start with L0 or zero norm. So what is this all about? So this is actually not a norm. The reason is the fact that the number of non-zero entries in a vector is not a norm. So when we scale a vector by a scalar it, a, so when we scale a vector by a scalar a, it does not affect or change the number of non-zero entries. Okay, so let me repeat that. When we scale a vector by a scalar, it does not affect or change the number of non-zero entries. So this can be done using this formula. So summation of x sub i raised to the power of one. So what is this all about? Okay, so Let's have this example. So for example, you have this um, scalar and these are the different values. So we have 0, 0, 2, and 0. So 0 plus 0 plus 2 to the power 0 plus 0. Then what is left is 0, uh, no, uh, 2 raised to the 0 power. Then it is equal to 1 because every number that is raised to the 0 power is equal to 1. So the 1 here tells us that there is only one non-zero value in our example. But of course, if we're going to have here 3, the answer here, here would be different. So for example, okay, 3, 0. Then it becomes plus 3 to the power 0, then plus 1 then of course our answer is two. So it means that we have two non-zero values in our scalar and these numbers are 
2 and 3. So it is a bit tricky to work with because here we can see zeroth power and zeroth root in it. So we have learned that any number that is raised to 0 is equal to 1. So obviously any x is greater than 0 will become 1. So this case or in this case the answer is 1 because there is only one non-zero element except that when we add here 3. So our answer is 2 because there are two non-zero elements in the scalar. I mean in the vector. So basically this corresponds to the total number of non-zero elements in the in the vector. So this means that you only have to count the number of non-zero elements. So without going through the process, we can just count 2, 3. But then, then again, the problem is that when we have a lot of non-zero elements, so I think that the calculation will really help us a lot. So later, we, we are going to talk about when are we going to, or when we can use that, this kind of method. So L norm, Let's go to the second one. So L1 norm is often used as a substitute for the number of non-zero entries. So this is also known as the Manhattan distance or a taxicab norm. L1 norm is commonly used in machine learning and deep learning when the difference between zero and non-zero elements is very important. So no matter how small would that be, for as long as it is higher than zero, even if it's just 0 0.001, then it really matters. So in many machine learning applications, it is always better to discriminate between these elements. And this means that when we move from zero every time by an element, then L1 norm increases. So say for example, let me draw here for better understanding. Is Okay, so let me another color. Okay, so this is going to this direction, of course. So if from the origin, you're going to move one point here and another point here and another point here and another point here going to infinity, as you move forward, the value increases. So this can be done using this formula. So we have this formula. So just like the first one, but only that we don't have this zero as an exponent. Okay, so we'll just add the absolute value of the elements. So for example, we have the vector three and four. So what do we do in here is that we just add the absolute values of 3 and 4. So with that, the absolute value of 3 plus the absolute value of 4, and that is equal to 7. So that means if you are here from this point, and you, you would like to go to this point, all you have to do is that, you have to cross point 3, you have to pass through it for you to be able to get this point. So, for example, a distance from this point to this point is 3 kilometers, and from this point going to this point is 4 kilometers. So, all in all, you've traveled 7 kilometers from the point of origin. Okay? So, it's like when, for example, you are working in a certain company and you are a delivery boy and then you are tasked to deliver certain order to your clients and you have to pass through different blocks. Okay, so this is the place of your office and this is the place of your client's residence so from this point you're going to travel here and from here going here and of course you can never have any way of making your travel less than 
seven kilometers. So you have to pass through this point because this is the only way and you have to go to this point which is your client residence. So basically that's the story behind it for L1. So you can see in this case that L1 is the distance you travel between point zero from the point of origin to the destination which is three four because if you're going to plot this on a graph on a plane so this point is three four so three for the value of x and for the value of y four so this is point three four so this resembles how a taxi cab drives between city block to arrive at its destination that's, it. that's what i have said in our example now let's go to the next one so this one is more interesting this is what we call l2 this is actually the most popular norm and this is also called euclidean norm it is the shortest distance to travel from one point to another so while in this case we don't consider shortcuts now in l number two we do consider shortcuts so what does this mean it is used frequently in machine learning and in deep learning which is simply denoted as x the absolute value of x with the subscript 2 sometimes is omitted okay so we have this formula in the in the computation so we sum we total all the values of x which is squared and then the total value again is raised to the power of one half and what do we do so let's use the same example in l1 this example for us to be able to understand how l2 works so again let's have the same story okay and our story is that you would like to have a shortcut because you are running out of time from this point going to this point because also your customer your client is losing patience waiting for you and he or she would like to receive the order as early as possible or as soon as possible okay so without going through this point and for it to arrive at this point you have to think of the shortest way possible okay of course you can go through here if there is a way right but the problem is that is this the shortest way of course not because when you go through this way of course the 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 time of travel would be more than than expected and the distance would be longer than than the shortest of course it's not the shortest because it's it would still have the same distance when you consider this way right when you consider this way so this way going to this way is also the same when you consider consider this way going to this way so all you have to do is that you're going to make a shortcut and the best possible way is that you're going to go directly from your point of origin going to the point of destination without any angle to to pass through so for example again using the same situation so we do this now why we do this because this is one half and we're going to make this this one the square root then three raised to the power of two plus four raised to the power of two so three times three is nine then four times four is sixteen nine times six or nine plus sixteen that becomes twenty five and the root square root of twenty five is five that means from the point of origin going to this point is only five kilometers see so it used to be seven kilometers if you're going to follow this longer route 
but then when you have a shortcut then that becomes just five kilometers save you've saved your time right and of course your energy and maybe some some resources if you're going to use the shortcut that's easier okay so we can see that this is the most direct point as what I have explained so one thing that you have to consider in taking L2 is the fact that each component is squared right we square the component so this means that outliers may have more weight and this can really affect the result of course if they are outliers so in many contexts this norm may be considered undesirable because it increases very slowly going nearer to the origin of course right when the value is going nearer to the origin it becomes lesser than when it's when it's farther from the origin okay so our next norm is what we call the p norm or the lp so this is the category of function that depend on the value of p so to calculate this we should use this formula so this is our formula unlike l1 l2 and l0 wherein the subscript are the same all throughout the problems and in all situations in our case the value of the subscript or p would change depending on the situations okay so to calculate i mean so there is a sum of elements so we can think of it as a repetition over the i elements so let's identify the elements and then the steps so what does this mean what will we do first the first thing is that we're going to calculate the absolute value of the ith element and the next one is we're going to take its power what's the power of this ith element then we're going to sum all okay i think i i forgot to write it here so the next thing to do is that you're going to sum okay this is the value sum okay All right okay so you're going to sum all of those powered absolute values so after you've got this then you're going to sum then the next thing to do is that you're going to take the power 1 over p of the result so let's have this one as an example for better understanding so just like your number one l number one but in this case we use here one over one considering the fact that our p here is equal to one of course it would change so for example in some situations wherein the p would become two Okay, but in our case, just for the sake of this example, we, we, we would just use 1 for p. So we have 3 plus 4, 1 over p. So 3 plus 4, then that is 7. Because 1, okay, let me do it like this, 1. So this becomes 1. Then 1 times, uh, divided by 1, that is 1. So any number raised to the power of 1 is equal to itself so our answer is 7 okay see but of course it would change if we have here 2 so in this case we're going to get the power I mean the the square root of 7 if that's the case okay so what about this one this is really more interesting so you could see lots of things going on in here so the, then this norm is called L infinity norm so what is this one so this kind of norm gives the largest among each element of the vector so this means that you don't you do not need to compute should you want to hasten the process that is if you would like to to make your work faster but of course in some cases in most cases especially if you're dealing with some problems you have to go through the process but for the sake of our discussion I'd like to discuss of course the formula for you to be able to know what's going on behind um, this kind of norm 
so that when we go to our next to our topic in the future especially with respect to normalization um, it would be more it would be easier for you to be able to understand how the process really works okay so we have here of course this is the the formula the equation that we need to use in identifying the maximum value so they are the same this formula and this formula are the same I'm just giving these two things to you maybe in the future or after this you would be able to meet two or one of them so that's why um, familiarizing yourself with these two equations would let you know that they are actually the same that you don't need to really dig deeper about each one because they are just the same so for example okay anyway maybe you'd ask me oh, what's the meaning of this infinity why do we have in here so infinity here means that we are considering very very large number okay again infinity is a large number so let's have this example for better understanding so the vector x has these elements negative 2 0 2 10 so using this one we're going to use this so negative 2 raised to the power of 3000 why 3000 our value here is 3000 okay the value of p or the infinity value is 3000 plus 0 of course we don't need to use the power of 3000 here because it, it would still be 0 plus 2 plus 10 raised to the 3000 then its quantity is 1 over 3000 so infinity 10 because this is cancelled that becomes 0 then 10 3000 1 over 3000 then cancelled in 10 okay so the value is 10 I mean the, the highest or the maximum element in our vector is 10 so the L infinity norm is still 10 so only the largest element has the effect so if your vector represents the cost of building a cloud infrastructure for example so by minimizing L infinity norm we can reduce the cost of the most expensive infrastructure so this can be used in finding the worst case scenario the maximum outlier or the problem so see that's how it is used so first savings and then second if you would like to detect a certain problem an, out, an, 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 an outlier in your problem in your data then you can have that what is this for why do we have to study this calculating the length or magnitude of vectors is often required as a part of a regularization method or as a part of broader vector or matrix operations this is used to define a, lo a loss function in terms of the magnitude of the distance between predicted and the actual points after all being said and done let's try this what is a norm what are the kinds of norm how are they used what is the role of norm in deep learning don't forget to write your answers in the comment below so we can discuss properly do not forget to subscribe like and share please click the bell button to be notified every time we have a new session See you in the next lesson.